Hello and welcome to episode 37 of Phil's Photography Journey podcast. I hope you are well and I'm delighted to have Ivan Weiss on the podcast. Ivan, welcome. Thanks for having me, Phil. And just so that people can understand a bit about who you are, what you do, Ivan, if we're in an elevator going to a fairly up the elevator of a fairly tall building and you had to explain in that journey time what you're all about, what would you tell me? So I build myself as a headshot and portrait photographer. The vast majority of my work is with people in the entertainment industry and I shoot the pictures that they use as their primary marketing material. I also do a lot of work with small and medium-sized businesses creating similar images with a slightly different purpose, but essentially I, I take pictures of the front of people's heads. Nice one. Roughly then, when did it all start for you? How, how, how young were you and why photography? What, what got you into that particular journey of yours? I think I was always going to be a photographer. My, my dad was a photographer. So from birth, there's been cameras and film and negatives and chemicals and, <laughs> and everything all around me. I grew up in a house that was just completely dominated by photography. My dad worked in press and publicity mainly. Also, he did a lot of social documentary photography, what what we would probably call now street photography. So I learned photography from him as a kid. And, you know, there were pictures on the wall. There were piles of, you know, files of, of Neg's lying around the place and camera equipment everywhere. It was just a, a huge part of my childhood. You know, every every picture that we saw on a newspaper or that came up on the television was was immediately critiqued. I think I was maybe seven or eight years old. My dad had a, he, he also did a lot of teaching of photography. I mean, he, he's retired now, but it, you know, he still shoots occasionally. But he, he had this job teaching at a local youth center. And I went along to that and there was a dark room. He gave me a Canon A1 and I learned the basics of analog photography, you know, exposure triangle, composition, how to process a film, how to make a contact sheet, how to make a print, all of that kind of stuff. I was so young that I I guess I just assumed that that's what all kids were doing with their dads at the weekend. <laughs> um, <laughs> turns out that's not the case. It was, it was just there. It was just part of it. I didn't really pursue it as a thing. I mean, I, I remember when I was 16, I decided that I wanted to take photography as an A-level but I was advised against it by some not so clever people, as it turns out. To be fair, I only was opting to do it because it sounded like it would be really easy because I already knew how yeah, to do it. You were, like, you were a long way there. What's going to be the easiest A-level? But no, they, they said, you know, you're, you can do academic subjects and go to university. So I was dissuaded from, from taking it then. But I always had a camera. I always took pictures. I just didn't think of it as anything other than just that's what you do. But I never took the normal pictures that other people were taking. You know, when I look back, now in the early days of digital photography i got a canon ixus the tiny little all-in-one thing and i've still got most of the things that i shot on that and it's you know going on a holiday to barcelona with friends and i was shooting like abstract details of architecture and plants while they were taking pictures of us you know standing in front of a landmark or whatever it's interesting um, actually i think because when most people start their journey whether that's just as a you know someone taking snaps or, or whatever it tends to be you know there's the thing that that's going on so I'll just capture that and I think from what you said there actually at quite a young age you were looking for those different details so maybe that photographer's eye was kind of developing then to pick out certain elements that would still tell a story absolutely yeah, yeah. it's just I wasn't conscious that that's what I was doing this is only something that became apparent to me later looking back at it once I had become a photographer in inverted commas much later in life so yeah it was just something that, that I did it only became a important part Part of my life, I think in about 2010, everything had moved over to, or most things had moved over to digital by then. I was working in India for a year, and one of my colleagues was very much into photography. He got me into the Strobist blog and a few other things that were around online at that time. I started to get interested in the what, what you could do with lighting in photography. It being all digital, it made it very easy to learn because you didn't have to take notes like you used to in the old days, what exposure settings you used on which frame to be able to analyze the results and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I just started getting 
interested in in that side of things, which was very different to the photography that my dad did. He, you know, he never really did much studio work. He didn't do anything with with lighting. It was all available light, shooting press and publicity, or social documentary. So it was about capturing what was going on, yeah. rather than this seemed to be opening the door to creating something with light, creating something in the studio to to take a picture of. And that grew and grew to starting to ask people for money to take their pictures on a very sporadic basis for for a number of years and also doing a lot for free until about 2017 I think I stumbled across a video of this loud American guy called Peter Hurley with <laughs> crazy curly hair who seemed overly enthusiastic about what he was doing the, the sort of thing that usually you know turns me off with my quite British sensibilities about these things but there was something to it there was something that that, that drew me in that's when the penny dropped for me that yeah what what I liked doing was taking pictures of people in a studio setting so being able to control everything being able to create something essentially from scratch but to have that interaction that that variable that that element of sort of randomness that each time it's a different person and the way that they're going to react to the camera and to me is going to be different each time and that's the thing that makes each picture unique and in that phase you obviously covered from development through education and, and into near to where we are now and we'll, we'll come on to that mm-hmm. a bit later but would you say that there was always the people element to it the portraiture element or or in the early days was it you still had that development of that photographer's eye but it was a, a variety of different subject matter well i think it was probably that i hadn't figured out what i really wanted to do with photography because i, I wasn't trying to but also a, a large element of that was being embarrassed or scared or worried about asking people if i could take their picture and i think from my earliest digital archive as i said you know i was taking abstract details a bit of architecture a bit of landscape a bit of anything really and then as i got into lighting i was yeah doing still life stuff at home i think you know i was trying to avoid asking people if i if mm. I could take their picture because i was i was worried about it i described it as the, the penny dropping because when i realized that what i wanted to do was take pictures of people it felt like yeah i should have worked that out years ago that was the thing that was missing but all of that time that i spent shooting other things really helped me because that's where i learned my technicals in a relaxed environment without having to worry about somebody getting bored or not wanting to cooperate or something like that you hit on there with the the technicals because almost everything that you pick up on the youtube and the magazine articles if they still exist it was all about this is where you put your lights and this is the settings it was all very very Mm -hmm. technical very almost nerdy and it was hang on a minute there's a person there (laughs) that needs to have their photo taken so i think yeah it put, put that method in didn't it prior to the kind of peter moment if you like were there any other photography artists that you admired or work that you followed either from a, a number of years ago or more recently i followed a, f- a few blogs i mean zach arias was one of them strobist was another to be honest i wasn't really following them for the work i was following them because i engaged well with their teaching style mm-hmm. and i found that i was able to get useful information from them in a non-annoying way there's lots of people who've got really good information out there but uh, at some point in the past I, I trained as, a, as an English teacher and I taught for a number of years I'm very aware that there's not really such a thing as a, a good teacher or a bad teacher it's there's somebody that works well for you mm-hmm. that you engage with well and it doesn't really matter how well they know their subject or even how well they're able to communicate it if they don't come across in the right way to you personally you're not going to learn as much from them as you would from from somebody who you chime with who you know is on something there that, that resonates with you so there, there was that definitely going on there was another really interesting thing around that same time i think about 2009 onwards i subscribed for a number of years to wired magazine and i wasn't thinking of it consciously I don't even think I really noticed it. But one of the things that I now realize attracted me to it was that the photography was very good. And subsequently, many, many years later, when I started specifically looking into the work of portrait photographers, working, you know, current portrait photographers, and stumbled across Dan Winters, I was like, oh, I've seen that picture before. Oh, right. He, oh, that's the guy who shot all of those pictures that kind of washed over me that I didn't really look at. I didn't think I was looking at specifically, but it's joined the dots. So that's what I found. 
sound appealing about that magazine at the time. That stuff that's definitely gone into my head and been sitting somewhere on a shelf in my brain for, for years. Once I got to a point where I was technically competent with studio photography and starting to feel like I knew what I wanted to say with my photography, that influence really, really came out. I think I'd, I'd say Dan Winters is, from a technical point of view, probably the, the biggest influence on the work that I'm doing at the moment. Just as you were talking then about the teaching aspect and, and how, because you know what YouTube's like, there's uh, there's almost too many out there and you kind of have to spend a lot of time to go through and say, actually, yeah, this is a guy I'm going to subscribe to or, or whatever the group. And then because there is that connection, and I guess in terms of photographer and subject in a headshot or portrait situation, there needs to be that connection to get the right result, the right outcome. Absolutely. And that's yeah. how those things get developed. Obviously, at some point in the last few years, you must have thought to yourself, actually, I want this to be my, my full-time gig. You know, I mm-hmm. want to, I'm, I'm earning money from a job, but what was that aha moment there where you thought, I'm going to pursue this. This is where I need to be. This is, this is a service mm-hmm. I need to provide. How did, how did all that come to light? I went off to Italy. Initial intention was to spend two years there teaching English just as a, you know, I'm in my mid-20s, why the hell not kind of thing. And I ended up staying there for 12 years. Through my language skills, I fell into a job with a company that did subtitling and dubbing for film and television. That turned into a 15-year career in that area of the media industry. I went through the ranks of the company, moved up to director of operations for Europe. A long, successful, in inverted commas, career in the, the world of corporate media companies in a large multinational. All the while, the photography was becoming more and more of interest to me and I had a regular salary, I had a place to live, so my spare income was spent on photography equipment. I, For a while, I fell into that trap of, okay, if I buy that lens, then I'm going to be good. Or, yeah, you know, Is it I, gas? Is that what this, they call it? <laughs> Gear acquisition yes. syndrome? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think <laughs> I'm definitely guilty of that. <laughs> definitely, definitely guilty of it. But at the same time, I'm quite curious about the technical side of photography. So having that ability did allow me to buy stuff and just figure out, well, what does this do? And again, that's all stuff that that became really useful to me later on when I was taking it more seriously. I got to a point where quite early on, I realized that I wanted to be paid for what I was doing, not because I needed the money or wanted to make it into a business, but it was more just about validation of my work. I realized it's quite easy to get people to let you take photographs if you do it for free. How does that tell you whether you're any good or not? And I want wanted to know whether what I was doing was any good. I didn't do it very frequently, but whenever I did have the opportunity, I would try and get some payment for it. And then that became a thing in the back of my mind of, well, this could be a job. There are other people that make a living from this. I know other people that make a living from this. I know some people that make a fairly good living from this, but I never had the courage to do it because I was in this comfortable, long career. I'd been with the same company forever, gone through recessions, redundancies, all the rest of it, and always weathered those storms. So I felt very firmly rooted in what I was doing. And the career was progressing there. You know, every couple of years, there was a, an opportunity for promotion. And, and it seemed like if I sit still here, I've got a pension, I've got private health insurance. So, you know, it, it's quite a, a tough thing to give up on. But then I, I just had one of those epiphany moments, I suppose, quite a grim way that it came about was I got called up for jury service. It was a coroner's court. I knew going in that it was going to be not very nice. And we spent three weeks poring over the details of the last three minutes of this poor guy's life. And it, I mean, it sounds funny to say it, but on the second day, I thought, this is better than my job. This is more interesting than my job. <laughs> this is more fulfilling than my job. Yeah. It feels like I'm doing something key, that's I, the, the outcome of this is going to matter to somebody. And so that was it, really. As soon as that court case was over, I it, it didn't feel like a big decision. It was like, yeah, I'm done. And I went into my boss and said, yeah, I'm, I'm done. I've had enough. That was it. And I walked out of a 15-year career and I didn't feel worried. I was like, okay, objectively, how on earth am I going to pay the rent? How on earth am I going to pay the rent next month? How on earth am I going to be paying the rent in six months' time? What the hell have I just done? But it wasn't anxiety-inducing. It wasn't worrying. It was, okay, this is a challenge. This is a problem. I need to sort this out. And the result of my thinking and decision making now is going to matter to somebody, me. So it felt like a big adventure, really, that I was going on. And no doubt in my mind whatsoever at that 
point, it was just, this is the thing I'm going to do. Oh, having that solid thought that Mm -hmm. this is going to happen and to do it without any feeling of anxiety clearly was the right decision. Some people (laughs) are probably still wavering. Well, yeah, we hope so. I discovered Ivan and Ivan's work prior to knowing Ivan through the Headshot crew. So I didn't realise, actually, there was a connection between Ivan and the Headshot crew initially because the work that I'd seen, that I discovered through spending time on the computer, as we do just, and again, possibly looking for some influence, some learning material, whatever. And I discovered Ivan online. So obviously, Ivan, whatever you're doing in terms of online presence and, and uh, keywording and all that good stuff, it's even even a few years ago, a couple of years ago, it was working. And then it's obviously, you know, m- m- moving forward, forward uh, i i then did see that ivan was in the headshot crew you know that's we're now talking in in the last few years so you joined the headshot crew 2017 was that you, did you join at that point when i think it was 2017 you said you, yeah. you first saw peter's videos yeah video. I, so I, I did the classic thing which which i i know now from speaking to lots of other people that lots of people went through this and it's classic for me as well i joined up on the the cheapest subscription and i spent several months not participating I just sort of looked at what other people were posting, watched some of the videos, read some of the comments, but I didn't dare put anything out there. <laughs> I didn't put my head above the parapet or anything. And then for whatever reason, I was feeling more and more stagnant in my job and devoting more and more of my free time to photography. So I tuned into one of the crew casts one evening. And that was a pivotal moment because that's when it really hit me what the big value of, of the headshot crew is. Because I had this, this bunch of people, all of them photographers all of them taking headshots all across the world and they were all just helping each other just being supportive and sharing information and having a joke and a laugh and all the rest of it but in a very just open and friendly way it just hit home it's like okay these people can actually help me these people know what i'm trying to do some of them have already been through it some of them are going through it right now they're all apparently just giving out all of that information for free like everyone's just sharing the whole thing so that's when i started getting a bit more active in the crew and then not long after that Peter had uh, he was holding his intensive workshop in London and I ummed and ahed about it as is my my nature and decided actually no I'm I don't think it's worth that kind of money I mean it's you know like how much information can you get in a weekend it's not worth that kind of price but he had a free sort of meet up the night before a pub open to all so I went along to that and I met Pedro Pedro George I met Peter I met a bunch of other people it was the weirdest photographers meet up I'd ever been to nobody asked me what camera system I shoot nobody was doing the you know nerdy talk about what's your favorite f-stop or other such nonsense it was just a bunch of people enthusiastic about taking pictures of people and it felt incredibly refreshing and just reaffirmed that thing that okay yeah that is what i want to do and here are a bunch of people at all different levels at all different stages in their development but they're all doing the thing that i really want to do so that was the moment really when things began to turn for me and although i decided not to do the intensive workshop with peter in london i went home looked up when is the next one the next one was a month later in new york booked a ticket for New York, called up a friend who I used to work with in Italy who lived in New York and arranged to stay on her sofa. And I went off to do the intensive in New York a month later. The funny story of that is I got off the plane and went into town and went for a little walk and actually bumped into Peter on the street. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> within sort of 20 minutes of being in the city. And there you go. There's Peter Hurley. Okay. And yeah, that that really just gave me that that extra boost of confidence of okay that here's a path to turning this into something that I can actually make a living from here's a path to turning this into a, a business and a career uh, this progression within the headshot crew subject to meeting the required levels of performance and critique but your role Ivan you so you, you're more than just a crew member so if you'd like to talk <laughs> a bit about your kind of involvement a bit more in the uh, in the headshot crew 
Sure. For most people that are in the crew, when you join, your level is protege. And, and the aim when you're a protege is to get to associate status. And that means that you have created a portfolio of work that is approved by Peter himself and is deemed to be up to the standard of work that he requires so that he would feel comfortable referring work to you. Work that's booked in his name could be completed by you. You know, that's a fairly standard system in any creative artist endeavor that you've got a, a studio that sort of sets the standards and people work as apprentices or proteges and learn to replicate the style of the the master once it's been deemed to be achieved you're you're given that badge that's a great way of doing it because even if you then go on to develop your own style or you work in a slightly different area of photography having that mastery of the the technicals having that mastery of all of the requirements is great discipline it's, it's a great system for for learning and the work that i do my more creative work doesn't look like peter's work at all but it's all based on the stuff that i learned in that period where i was being coached and critiqued and trying to attain that that standard. So I think we've got something like 120, 130 associates in various parts of the world and many, many more people that are working towards that that standard right now. Then the, the next level from there is, I mean, it's not something that you can put yourself forward for, but just joining in with the spirit of the crew and helping other people. Peter selects people who are particularly active at doing that and ask them to be mentors. So I'm, I'm one of the, the group of mentors. I think there's 20 or so of us, again, in various parts of the world. Essentially, yeah, we're chosen for being active and hopefully useful at supporting the other people in the crew on on their journeys. So that that's part of why I then went on and, and became a instructor for the intensive workshop. That's part of my role as a as a mentor. And then just yeah, doing things like giving people portfolio critiques at the Headshot Mania event that we had a couple of months back. There as an assistant for Pedro during his lighting class and doing all of the behind the scenes carrying in of, of equipment, breaking <laughs> down equipment, and fetching cups of coffee for the sponsors, all of that really detailed technical photographic work. But just help, helping out, I think, is the thing. Headshotcrew.com, by the way. You can have a look on there and look up all sorts of photographers. Have a look at Ivan's portfolio when you're on there. Uh, or, or just go to his website. That, that's always good. It's yeah. some fantastic work. So that was uh, for me as well. I mean, I've, I've talked about the Headshot Crew setup on and off on different episodes. I think what you picked up earlier on there, Ivan, was that willingness to cooperate, collaborate and help with each other's development. I don't know of any other industry. So if you say, I'm, I'm self-employed and potentially some of these might be my competitors, but actually we're all going to sit down and two or three times a week help each other plus on offline or whatever you know online offline mm -hmm. it's it is refreshing and i think you know in the in the few meetups that, that i've been to you're right we, we almost don't talk any technical that often comes up in the crew setup in the structure of that you can go to whatever degree you want to on that it's really great uh, even though we just kind of operate as individuals you know with a client it's quite a kind of very one-to-one -one type thing typically when we get together as a group it's fantastic and obviously we in february we were at headshot mania thank goodness we got in and, and out of there before the recent situation in, yeah. in the world. What I want to sort of move on to, Ivan, is really on, on the portraiture side of things. You developed quite a style there in recent times. Again, very impressive. We were we were delighted to go along and see your exhibition in, in London last summer. Hopefully there'll be more of those in better times when, when things oh, yeah. move on. <laughs> What's the sort of story there as to how that particular part developed? Was that was that connected back to some of your earlier influences or did that come about separately? Well, I, I think the, the first thing on, on that subject that I can't say often enough is that I think the distinction between a headshot and a portrait is something that exists in the mind of photographers, but not necessarily in the minds of the people who we take pictures of. And, and even amongst photographers, there's a fair amount of disagreement about where the line is, when is this a portrait, when is it a headshot. And, and I just don't think it matters. It definitely matters that you know what you want the image to do, what you want the image to say, what you want the image to communicate to the, the viewer. And, and it's perfectly fine if what you want it to say is, 
what do you think of this? Like, it doesn't have to have a definite message. I'm not saying that. But if it's not going to have a definite message, you need to be aware that that's what you're saying with it, is there isn't a definite message. Knowing what your subject is going to, in broad terms, use the image for is going to dictate to a large extent what kind of style you shoot them in. And because I work a lot with people in the entertainment industry, they don't just need a picture of them looking reasonably sane and looking reasonably well scrubbed and, and polished and all the rest of it. They may well also need to be able to suggest the types of roles that they might play if they're an actor or they're a performer, like a comedian's going to need something, some element of humor in the picture or, yeah. you know, all of that kind of stuff. So there's an overlap there with what you could call editorial portraiture. But I genuinely think that for most people, what they're looking for is a cool picture of their face. It strikes me that you can do that through following set formulas of how to light a face and how to do the retouching and how to have them pose and how to coach them and, and all of those things. You can also bring in your own imagination. And that's where my fascination with the technical side of lighting and the technical side of post-production really came to the, the fore. I just stumbled across this style of lighting that I found very pleasing that seemed to create images that nobody else was making. It wasn't intentional. It's just, I mean, it was intentional in that I was intending to try stuff out and see where it went and let my imagination and my taste dictate what the final image would look like. I didn't know where it would end up. And I think that's a constant process and it's in evolution. And in doing anything like that, I think it's inevitable that the influences you have absorbed some consciously, but many subconsciously, they just come out. When you're sitting there deciding on whether the skin should look a bit more pink or a bit more green than it currently does, what are you basing that on? You know, I'm not trying to necessarily represent reality. I'm trying to represent a mood or a feeling, and that's going to be based on billions of, of images that I've seen over the course of my lifetime and stored away in my brain certainly a brand I can identify the Ivan style when I see those and I think you know when you see uh, quite a variety of different subjects that I've seen with, with stuff that you, you post and you do you look into the eyes or you, or you look at the expression and it does get your mind thinking as to what captions or, or thoughts mostly thoughts you know what, what are they thinking what, what's there where have they been to where are they going to that kind of thing and I think that the way you've worked like you say with the post processing perhaps and there's a certain skill art to the lighting maybe that goes back to your early influences of the fascination with the light that you you know now with modern technology and, and options that you're able to to bring that to bring that out but I think that whilst they work really well online having seen them also printed and mounted and displayed I actually see with some of your work and the, and the styling of that I almost liken it to the really big kind of gallery style portrait gallery almost sort of canvas style and it'd be nice to see something like that it's put me put in my request for your next <laughs> exhibition sure, sure it might up your, everything up your printing costs you've got the time and the budget Phil you know yeah. that <laughs> yeah, we'll, get, we'll get some sponsors lined up maybe but you know that and that's the thing I think is if it's not just looking at a picture okay yeah what's the next one but I think you look at that and you, you think about it and for me and I think that's that's really powerful and I mm -hmm. think you've, you've had some success I think in, I'm right in saying where people have picked up on some of this perhaps through social media and they've kind of connected with you from from what they've seen so there's a style has leapt off the page if you like to them in their their brain and their motivation and then you've been able to connect up yeah yeah, I mean, I'm based in London. There's no shortage of photographers in London. There's also no shortage of people that need or want the services of a photographer. So in that sense, current situation notwithstanding, <laughs> it's a healthy market. And I think from the point of view of the consumer, the only real decision that you need to make when you're choosing a, one photographer over another is, do I like the work? If you're not a photography in enthusiast, you know, you're not an art critic, you, you may not be able to explain why you like some pictures mm. more than others. You may have no interest in learning how to explain those things. And that's perfectly fine. But I do think most people are able to say, yeah, that looks cool. Eh, that one, not so much. I think it's fundamentally important for photographers 
in those crowded markets to have a style of their own. And I don't think it's something that you should aim to manufacture. I don't think it's something you should aim to, this is what I want it to be and this is how I'm going to get there. I think it's something that just comes out of you if you let it. It's really important to be truthful to that and be authentic with your style. You know, if your thing is making everybody look hideously awful and scared and screwing up the skin tones so they all look weird and all the rest of it, but that's the thing that gives you pleasure as an artist, then you really should pursue that because anything else is not going to give you satisfaction. If you don't find a market for it, of course, there's a problem because you still need to make a living. But I think in a, a market as big as London, you, you'll find people that like what you do, whatever it is you do. Um, you know, there, there, are in, there are more than enough consumers for the number of photographers that we have. And I think if you're working in a style of photography that you don't personally find satisfying, your work's never going to be as good as it could be. And your aim should be to you know, make the work that really satisfies you that is as good as it can be in your eyes as the artist. If you're not doing that, then to quote a mutual friend, you're not playing the game. I like that, actually, the way you put that, that to almost create in your own world the opportunity for these things to come out and to let things in. And it's even though I'm going to ask you this question in a bit, it might be quite difficult to say, this is where I want to be in this period of time and these are the checkpoints along the way. It's probably easier to say, come back to me in a couple of years and then I'll tell you where I am then and how I got there. <laughs> Because yeah. yeah, yeah. in creative world, I mean, I you know I had a long corporate career and all very structured and regimented and compliance. So I'm I'm loving the fact that I can just now be freed from the shackles a bit. But you have to train your mind to to go into that that world. Uh, and obviously, mm-hmm. I'm I'm not the only photographer, and obviously in present company as well, it's been that been down that route. In the industry, going back to your early days, we touched on the developing the dark room and the contact sheets and the processes around there. Have you ever been? motivated to pick up any of that again bearing in mind there seems to be a community of photographers that have gone back to film i'm not sure they've gone back fully but i think they've done it maybe just as a personal project type of thing and seen where it's gone no my learning style is chaotic i'm a non-linear learner something sparks my interest and i want to know everything possible about it now and if that's not the recognized starting point for learning that thing i don't care i'll come back to the start if i deem it to be interesting later on i'm not good at structured learning part of why i dropped out my a levels i don't want to do things in order or methodically i do things intuitively and that might not be the best way to learn but it's what works for me. The biggest drawback that I have with analog photography is that the data is not there. You (laughs) can't go back. You can't look at the back of a print and be told when it was shot on what camera with what lens, what aperture and all of that kind of stuff. The acceleration in my learning was 100% to do with the fact that I was shooting digital and I was able to go back and, oh, how did that turn out like that? And retrace the steps of all of the post-production and all of the production to understand why things in that image looked a certain way and in the other image didn't. Film doesn't hold any nostalgic value for me. I just don't get why all the extra effort. I do understand that creative device of placing limitations on yourself Mm. in order to push yourself and create more or create something different. And I get why people do that, but I'm also not very patient. I want to see the image straight away. I don't want to have to wait until it's of all the people shooting film now very few of them are uh, as far, the people that I know uh, very few of them are, are processing their own they shoot and yeah. then they send it off so there's an even longer wait you're outsourcing a fundamental part of the process to mm. somebody else and it doesn't hold any fascination for me personally that said I spend a lot of time colour grading things based on the looks of certain film stock I'm no stranger to putting a bit of film grain on onto an image mm. to give it a, a specific look but I think that's the beauty of, of digital is yeah. that you you can do that. Nothing against it. I, I don't look down or up to people that shoot film. It's just really not not for me. One thing that I do really specifically remember from when I was a kid and, and shooting film was the magic of seeing the print come up in the develop tray, the excitement and, and magic of that. I suppose a lot of people who shoot film, if they're doing their own printing, that's one of the things that keeps them hooked 
to it. But I, I genuinely feel that same excitement at two stages in the digital process. One is taking the shot and seeing it come up on the screen, you know, because I mostly shoot tethered, seeing it come up on the screen instantly. There's still that thing of it doesn't look exactly like the scene that I'm observing in front of me with my eye. It looks like the way my camera perceives it. And the way my camera perceives it is based on how I've set my camera and how I've set my lights and all of those things. So it's still got that magic of it being a different interpretation of the reality that I'm looking at with my eye. And then the same thing happens at the end of post-production. In the case of a straightforward business headshot where it's supposed to present a realistic interpretation of the person, perhaps the effect is not quite as dramatic, but it's still, hopefully, (laughs) I'll tread carefully how I say this, but I tend to prefer looking at the pictures I've shot of a person than looking at the person themselves. Does that sound terrible? (laughs) No, I fully understand that. (laughs) Because I think, you know, the the picture is supposed to present them as like, wow, look at this person. This person is interesting or this person is like really fun or this person is like Mm. super confident in what they're doing. And the picture needs to present that straight away. Whereas looking at the actual person, as you know, you go through the whole gamut of emotions once you point a camera at somebody in the Mm. studio from like, total fear and terror to cracking up laughing and you know all of the the bits in between the the magic of seeing the picture come up in the dark room is still there for me in the the digital world similar to you in in terms of what we do and tethering to the computer and having that as a kind of coaching aid within a session with a client yeah that's gone (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. that's not going to happen so in terms of where else you might go then have have you got any thoughts as to the next couple of years or or so and and i'm talking in the wider creative sphere i mean video is that anything that appeals to you perhaps or any other um At the moment, video doesn't hold any fascination for me. I I'm, I don't watch a lot of television. I don't go to the cinema. I'm not that interested in the moving image. I'd rather sit and look at one still for an hour and a half than watch a film. I'll fall asleep in a film, but I won't if it's a still yeah. image. I don't know. I don't know why that is. That's just how I'm wired. That said knowing how to light is a very sought after skill in film production. I'm not saying that it's something that I would do purely for a way to make money, but I can see why a lot of photographers end up going into that side of things. Because if you do understand how to use light and color to construct a scene, it's another creative outlet for the same impulse, I suppose. I definitely wouldn't rule it out, but to date I have never shot a video or shown any interest in shooting a video. Plenty of friends and colleagues who do a bit of both or or are solely concentrated on video, but it's not something that's in the plan at the moment. I mean, in terms of gear, what's your go-to gear in terms of camera lenses and rough lighting setup for your your work? The the main camera that I shoot is the Canon EOS R. My my dad was, and still is, a a Canon shooter, so there was never a point when I questioned that. It was, I was given bits and pieces of unused equipment to practice on, and it was all Canon. Once I was buying my own camera bodies, I still wanted to be able to borrow all my dad's lenses, so (laughs) it, it made perfect sense. The EOS R is my current main camera most of my work i shoot either on 85 mil or 50 mil lenses the 85 i've got is the ef so the the older technology ef uh, 85 mil 1.4 l and for the 50 mil i've got the rf lens the latest and greatest and it's my favorite the best lens I've, I've ever owned i really really enjoy using that it doesn't have any of the things that people sometimes complain about of looking too clinical and all the rest of it it's just damn accurate and opens to 1.2 uh, nice. which is really nice <laughs> I I mean, we we talked about gear acquisition syndrome earlier. And as I said, I definitely went through a period where I had a good salary and was able to buy lots of stuff just to find out what it did. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that as long as it's inspiring you to shoot. That was definitely always the case for me. I don't think I fell into the trap of thinking this camera is going to make my photography better just by owning it. I was aware that it would make me a better photographer by using it and shooting more pictures. If that's where you are right 
right now. Don't go into debt doing it. If you feel that buying that new lens is going to make you excited to go and take pictures, then buy the lens and go and take the pictures. It's only a problem. A, it's a problem if you spend more money than you can afford, obviously. But B, it's a problem if you just buy the stuff and then don't use it, Mm. which a lot of people do. If you're fascinated by studio strobes, go and buy them play around with them, see what's interesting to you, what's not interesting to you. It may end up that in a couple of years' time, you sell them secondhand. That's absolutely fine. There'll be somebody that that buys them. But if you're curious about something, investigate it. Take pictures and see if you like the results. When I first started getting into lighting, I had speed lights. And I think that's where a lot of people start. I was using Canon cameras back then, so I had Canon speed lights. I got three of them, and I thought that was, you can do anything with three lights, it seems. As I moved on, I realized that they didn't quite have enough power for what I wanted to do, and they're very expensive. I mean, they've got lots of features that are useful for lots of different types of photography, but I cottoned on that you don't need that when you're in a studio. So I moved over to the Godox system and still have a quite a a range of Godox gear. The AD200s were a game changer for me in terms of they're not dissimilar to using speed lights in terms of their size and their battery operated and radio controlled and all of that, but they're far more powerful. So you can move into doing proper studio photography for for want of a better term. Especially, you know, if you're shooting portraits of one person at a time, they've got more than enough power to cover you for all kinds of eventualities there, even if you want to shoot F11 or something. So the the AD200s, I still use those as as accent lights. And if I'm going out on location, I want to take something just in case. That's my go-to light. I've got the AD600s as well, which are getting even more powerful, but bigger and bulkier. They don't see a lot of use nowadays. I started using those, and then I started getting into constant light. I have the Peter Hurley Flex Kit from Westcott, which is my main setup for all of my standard headshots um i've got the old the old version of that kit so it's uh daylight balanced two one by three panels and two one by two foot panels and then in more recent times getting more and more into constant light and led technology i've got a few bits of kit from nan lights i've got the forza 300s which is a hugely powerful single point light source LED. It doesn't have any of the previous drawbacks of those kind of lights with older technology. It doesn't get very hot. It doesn't consume much power, but it is hugely bright. What I like about that as compared to the Flex Kit is that because it's single point, I can put it into any kind of modifier so I can use different shapes of light. The Flex Kit's fantastic, but the the limitation of it is that the panels are a certain shape and you can't change the shape of the, the panel. You can if you take the take it off the frame and turn it into a drum or, or something like that. But I tend to prefer putting my lights through some kind of diffusion. So they stay on the panels, the, the flex kits. They stay on the frames with the diffuser. Whereas with the Ford, so yeah, I can put that into any of the... I use Elinchrom Rotolux modifiers, so octaboxes, square boxes, those kind of things. And there's enough power in the 300s to use that with a couple of uh, layers of diffusion and still get used light for a portrait setup and i've also got a couple of the rgb tubes that they produce they're called parvo tubes and they're great for adding color to a scene i've just got one of the shorter ones and one of the longer ones and i use them as either in combination with the key light to give a color cast to the key light or as a background light a kicker a fill to give a cast to the shadows with the portraiture work, if I go with the table style, do you typically look to develop that as you go? Has that evolved over time as well? So the next client you do, you might actually bring in something else. Uh, how does that typically work? Yeah, I, I mean, the, the process is, I, I, I think it's a sort of standard process, problem solving process that you can apply to pretty much anything in life, really, certainly to all photography lighting. So I start with the key light in terms of positioning. So the the key light that I use for that table portrait series is intended to replicate the long bank of windows that you would find in a traditional 
artist studio for classical painting or portrait. The process then is once I have the shape of the light from the key light, what problems is it creating? Where are my shadows too dark? Where am I losing detail? And so then I start adding fill lights to solve those problems. And with each shoot I do, new problems come up and get solved and they go into the problem solving kit bag or whatever you want to call it. For some of those portraits, it's literally one light, maybe a reflector on the other side just to control the shadows. Sometimes it's seven lights. If, if I want to bring out a specific bit of detail that's not being brought out by the key light, then I need to find some other way to do that. But I ought to be with multiple lights to be able to get a contrast between specular details and soft shadow transitions. In, in some of my more recent work, I've been using a Fresnel lens on the Forza 300 as the key light. It gives you a very hard light, mm. which is really nice and punchy. And then I'm using a ring light on camera with no diffusion as my main fill, which again is really a hard light and very punchy, but then using a, a variety of different fill lights in various points around the frame to control those shadows and make it softer where I don't want that strong contrast. So it's a way to really draw the viewer's eye into the high contrast areas on the face, but still have a lot of softer detail all around the frame so that it holds the interest. I find that quite a, an interesting thing to play with, that kind of contrast. And then more and more, I'm experimenting with having different color temperatures for my lights or different color tints for the lights, essentially to do the same thing, to provide an extra way of creating contrast between different elements in the frame and draw the viewer's eye to a, a certain bit or send the viewer's eye around the frame in a certain way. You seem to have a range of different lighting options there. And I think when you said seven could be used in some situations, obviously that's, did you build up to that? A lot of photographers, I think, find or, or, or think that seven lights sounds scary. In my mind, once you've added a second light, you can add 52 of them if you want. Yeah, it's, it's the, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's the exact same process. It's about intention. If you're looking at your frame and saying, there's a problem here that I want to solve, you can add a light to solve that problem. I mean, assuming the problem is something to do with the lighting. If the, if the problem is the wardrobe, then mm. you're not going to solve it by adding lights. But generally what you do with a fill light is it solves the problem of the shadow created by the key light. That's what it's there for. So if you can do that with one fill light you can do that with six fill lights you can do that with 20 fill lights if you need to if you don't need to then don't do it a picture doesn't get better because you've added more lights to it but if you've got an area of the frame that hasn't got the right amount of light in it you can use a light to solve that problem the possibilities are almost endless i guess with the subject with whatever mood we're trying to create the lights can help i guess also having some kind of visions or at least to know where you want to go next to try the next thing and then add yeah. to it if, uh, if you haven't already, please look at Ivan's work and you'll see some of this in reality you know, in terms of the finished product. One thing that I like to do sometimes is, I guess it's a bit of an in-joke as well, is I make sure that the key light is not visible in the subject eyes so that the catch light is not coming from the key light which like, standard advice is your key light should provide a catch light. But sometimes I intentionally hide that just because I know that photographers look at the catch light to s try and work out how the scene has been lit. So by hiding that, it's a bit of an in-joke <laughs> that it's not there. It's almost um, your signature, which isn't a signature. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Signature written in invisible ink or something, yeah. I suppose. That's not done just for that purpose. I like the look of that where the eyes are lit by the fill light rather than the key light. But obviously the key light is what gives you the main shape and dynamic to the image. That's why it's the key light. But it, there's all kinds of things that you can do to cheat that and play around with that by adding other lights in a subtle or not so subtle way. Good. Ivan, I've recently started to use Affinity Photo for my editing, encouraged by members of the crew and most certainly your good self. But I understand you've had a connection with them for a little while now. 
Yeah, uh, I started using Affinity pretty much as soon as I started getting into post-production in a serious way. Years ago, I think like many, many people, I think the Statue of Limitations has passed. I had an illegal copy of Photoshop. I didn't know what I was doing with it. I was just told that I needed to have it. But as soon as I moved into charging money for my photography, I felt very uncomfortable with using illegal software to do that. So I started looking around for alternatives because I wasn't earning much money from my photography so didn't want to pay for this is pre-subscription photoshop which was hugely expensive it was yeah i stumbled across affinity photo and started using that and that's where i developed all of my post-production ability and, and techniques just around the time that i quit my day job and went all in on being a full-time photographer i was posting work regularly to instagram and i was contacted by the people at Affinity because they'd seen some of my work and they asked if they could commission a piece. I think it was within two weeks of me quitting my job and I had this large respected company asking if they could commission a piece from me. That fed what a, into What a the, perfect yeah. decision you made. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like, this, this is going to be so easy. Yeah. This, like, why, I did, why didn't I do this sooner? And they're a very artist-focused company. I've been approached by some larger companies than a Affinity, some companies significantly larger than Affinity asking me to do stuff for free, which I have politely declined. There's none of that nonsense with Affinity. They're artist focused. They asked me to submit a quote and they agreed to it. And it was just a totally wide open brief. They said, we like your work. Do some more work. What have you got? And they just let me have complete creative control and they paid my rate, no haggling, no arguing. That established what continues to this day, a mutually beneficial relationship. There's nothing formal about it. I'm not an ambassador. They don't pay me any money or anything, but I've been to their launch events and I talk to them about what I do with their software and provide feedback on that. And they listen and it's a really, really good relationship that, that we have. And I think that's really, really important in the creative industries to if you can find relationships like that because it's really a great confidence boost to have that sort of thing going on to know that you've got the support of other people in the industry i paid for my copy of affinity photo i don't begrudge them those 50 pounds <laughs> last year when there was a, another free update i didn't even think it was a free update so i paid for a new one and they were like why are you paying more money because it's a new version mm. they're like no but it's free it's a free update i couldn't believe how good value it was yeah it's been a, a a great relationship so far and they're really focused on continuing to develop what the software is capable of and i really don't see any point in the future where that's not part of my workflow it performs very well their ipad option is almost full complement of full. functionality yeah the tutorials are good they don't just put it out there they support it really well yeah i've been very impressed with affinity i think their pricing is brilliant they've done a really good deal in the current climate which <laughs> is really really impressive actually so long may that continue What piece of advice would you give to someone who's in a good job at the moment, but actually they're quite good at photography as well, and they actually think, yeah, I've heard about Ivan and he took the plunge. What would they need to do to line up that role as a full-time photographer? How would they go about that? What would you recommend? (laughs) Well, I mean, there are two approaches to it. I'm, I'm not a financial advisor. I would say that if you're looking to launch a new business or a new career, expect to have a fairly long period during which it's not profitable. And, and that's fine. But make sure that you've got a way to get through that, some savings mm-hmm. or a loan or, or, or whatever it is that a, a partner who's able to support you or s- something like that to give you the space to be able to do it. That said, I know plenty of people who didn't have that luxury and circumstances forced their hand and they've made a go of it and been successful. So it's definitely possible. But you know, in an ideal world, give yourself the space to be able to have the time to find your feet with it and build it up. But really, the, the question question is, is this what you want to do? It's difficult to answer that because we put lots of mental blocks in our own way. We get confused between saying what we want and saying what we think we should be allowed to expect. Who says I should be able to make a living doing what I want to do when millions of people have to go and do jobs that they really don't like to make a living what makes me special that i should be able to make a living essentially 
playing. If you're honest with yourself and this is the thing that really gives you the most satisfaction, then I think you have to give it a try. If you don't, then you will probably regret that. It's often said that starting a business is like jumping off a cliff and figuring out how to make an aeroplane on the way down. That really does make a lot of sense, that analogy. Be aware that for the first bit of that free fall, it's going to feel fantastic because you've just jumped off the cliff and you're flying and you've never felt like that before. And it is amazing. But then you start to realize that the ground is getting nearer and the pace at which it's getting nearer is increasing quite rapidly. There are moments when it's scary and and challenging, but if you've got the conviction that this is a thing that you absolutely want to do, how bad can it go? The, The worst thing is that you fail and you go back to doing something else. Ivan, thank you very much for that. In terms of what you have planned, let's assume that the diary will open up again because of what's going on in the world, coronavirus, etc. And let's assume we've got a schedule of events building back in. Where could people connect up with you and perhaps get some benefit of your experience and what you um, bring? So the first place to find me is I'm super active on Instagram, London. People connect with me through that all the time, photographers and fans of photography and potential customers alike. In-person events, last year I hosted Peter Hurley's workshop here in London as I was the course instructor, so the, the headshot intensive, and that went really well. Uh, it we, did. We had, a, had a couple of deadbeats on there as yeah. well. Who uh, my apologies for that. <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely something that I would like to do again because that's like the intersection of my previous experience as a teacher and now my experience as a photographer. So I love doing that. Probably run another one of those, hopefully later in the year, once we've got a clearer picture of when people are going to be allowed out of quarantine. Will we expect to meet up for beers for that? one as well is there going to be a kind of sort of coming together absolutely Uh, the social side of it is as important as everything else we're not photo booths we're humans and and the social side of it is is absolutely fundamental so stay posted for dates on that i can't promise it's going to be anytime soon but we we definitely will do it again i would love to do another exhibition my half idea was to do that sometime in the summer of this year and we'll have to see how that goes it's not something that i want to do in the winter just because again the social side of it People like to go out in the evening and have a glass of Prosecco or something when mm. the weather's nice and it's warm, not so much when uh, when it's cold and rainy. If we don't manage to do that this year, then that will get pushed to next year. Ivan, thank you very much. Thoroughly enjoyed this interview. All the very best to you in your future career. The nice thing is we get to interact quite regularly as we're members of the Headshot Crew. I did mention it earlier. It will be in the show notes, but headshotcrew.com if you want to understand more about what goes on. Ivan, can you just remind us again your Instagram? To also Absolutely. Be in the show notes? I, I'm on Instagram at ivanweiss.london. That's also my website, ivanweiss.london. If you type in ivanweiss.london in any combination, you'll get my Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and everything, YouTube and all the rest of it. It's all labelled the same. Good stuff. We'll sign off now. Catch up again soon. Cheers. Cheers.